Welcome back to the channel guys, and thanks for tuning in. It's not often that I decide to respond to someone who responded to me. Frankly, a lot of them aren't very good videos and is rarely worth the time. I make an exception this time because it's on the topic of Flat Earth, which I know you guys just absolutely dig for some reason, as evident by a poll I put out earlier. Well, whatever. Let's do this. His video is quite long. I'll try to get to as much as I can, but realistically, I'll probably only respond to a portion of it. Also, for those of you who are watching this as a premiere, welcome. Let me know what you think of this, and maybe I'll do more of it in the future. Er, wait, that's if I remember to premiere this video. Whatever, let's just begin. Today, we'll be sticking it to Professor Stick. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. No, oh, wait, no, I have. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to look at something that has kind of come up to popularity recently, and is a new demonstration on how the sun works on a flat earth. Let me just fill you all in before we start. Sunlight during various parts of the year can be problematic to explain on a flat earth. Let's say during the summer when you could have 24-7 daylight at the North Pole. Of course, flat earthers can attempt to explain it away by claiming the sun moves closer or further away from the North Pole. During the summer, it would be closer and thus make a smaller orbit. During the winter, the sun moves further back. This is the idea they give to explain away how seasons work on a flat earth. Now, this may sound plausible during the summer. However, the winter can be much different. See, in reality, the sun would be shining on the earth at a low angle below the equator due to the earth's tilt. Ad hoc fallacy. How do you account for that tilt, Professor Stick? Where is the evidence that the earth was struck by another planet, and how do you account for the fact that the earth somehow stopped? Alright, let's slow down here. I gave an explanation because I wanted to introduce the fact that Antarctica can get 24 hours of sunlight during certain times of the year, namely near Christmas. And to do that, I wanted to explain why that happens. But okay, if you want to talk about the Earth's tilt, let's talk about it. Scientists have yet to say for sure why the tilt is present. However, there are a few hypotheses that sound very plausible. The one you mentioned is one of them, where the Mars-sized object collided with the Earth and caused it to tilt, along with producing the moon from debris. However, I'm not a personal fan of this theory since all other planets in the solar system also have some degree of tilt. The the theory I like is the conservation of momentum of the time the Earth was formed. When matter was pulled together by gravity, they rotate first around a center of mass before colliding into a clump. You can sort of see this pattern in galaxies, where stars and gas rotate around a center point of gravity, and is also similar in star formation. This rotation momentum was conserved once the Earth was formed, meaning it was somewhat random. Of course, the gravitational influence by the Sun would have tried to straighten it out. But as the Earth collected more and more mass from celestial matter, its weight became uneven, and that gave the Earth an unstable rotation. As a result, the Earth naturally tilted tilted and produced an axis of just over 23 degrees. Now I'm not going to explain this further since you're a flat earther and you don't even grasp the most basic parts of astronomy, so let's leave it at that. If you want evidence, then I'm sorry that unfortunately these are just speculations based on our current understanding of physics. But either way, no matter what actually caused the axial tilt, one thing is for sure, is that this tilt exists. That has been verified and measured, and is the reason seasons exist. People in eastern countries have calculated the Earth's tilt way in the past. I'm talking 1000 BC, and if you want to do it yourself, you could. Just use some trigonometry to measure some shadows during different times of the year. And of course, look up at the orbits of the stars. If you've done these and still say there's no evidence, then I think we're more looking at the fact that you just don't believe in our current model of the Earth, rather than the axial tilt. It's kind of useless to argue about this anyway, since you don't believe the Earth is round, and that's a prerequisite to believing the axial tilt exists. But either way, this isn't the main topic of the video, so let's move on. I thought like Newton you believe that objects in motion stay in motion. If that is the case, why did the Earth stop its deviation at 23.4 degrees? Irregular mass distribution can do that. If the Earth was, say, heavier at one point, it will straighten out so that this heavier part is on the new equator. Newton's law states that if something is in motion, it will stay in motion unless acted upon by another force. Are you just going to assume that no other forces were present? You just didn't mention the second half of that part of Newton's law. Kind of dishonest, wouldn't you say? Aside from the fact that that convenient measurement leaves a difference of 66.6 .6 degrees, from its supposed original 90 degree axial orientation. That would be the case if the tilt were 23.4 degrees, but in reality it's 23.436 or something like that. And guess what? It's actually always changing. It is oscillating as we speak and is currently steadily declining. Eventually, after a few tens of thousands of years, it will go down to just over 22 degrees, in which we'll start going back up. It's never truly steady. But yeah, let's just for no reason round that down to 23.4 degrees and say it becomes 666. Whatever floats your boat, man. <laughs> what does this flat earther imagine it is? head anyway. A group of scientists all huddled around in a room, going like, yes, let's make it 23.4 degrees so that if you put 0 degrees where 90 is supposed to be, for whatever fucking reason, you'll see 66.6. .6. And we're doing this because to display our distaste towards God. <laughs> the problems are exponential. You have to believe the Big Bang in order to believe the Earth is a globe. And as I've shown, modern physics contradicts the idea of a primeval atom due to its 
dependence on dialectical reasoning. Oh, look at you, trying to use physics to debunk physics. Let me just set some definitions straight so you don't butcher them to death and strawman actual scientific claims. The Big Bang is simply the expansion of space, which means since space is expanding now, the Big Bang is still happening as we speak. It also describes the expansion of space from a supposed singularity 13.8 billion years ago. However, it doesn't say anything about how this singularity came to be, how the first atom came into existence, or how the universe popped into reality. That's just extra content you creationists are trying to loop in with the Big bang in an attempt to discredit it. Awfully reminds me of evolution and abiogenesis. If you want to talk about the origin of the universe, fine, we can talk about it. You said you've talked about this already in another video of yours, but I'm not about to dig it up right now, so if you want to have this discussion, you'll have to link it to me or something. Number two, the Big Bang contradicts the heliocentric conception of the sun. Thermal expansion produces an eccentric force, not an attractive force. Ah, <sighs> there is thermal expansion, but it was mostly an expansion of space, which I realize a lot of you guys who deny science can't seem to grasp, but let's go with that. Okay, sure, some eccentric forces will be in play, which produces torque, causing certain objects to rotate along an axis, but how in the world could you jump from that to, the sun can't be an attractive body? There's absolutely no relation here between the premise and the conclusion. Just because one force exists doesn't mean another can't, and gravity is one of those forces that exists especially for large masses no matter what other forces are in play. And yes, that means even eccentric forces. And at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if you just arbitrarily picked up difficult sounding words in an attempt to confuse the audience. Number three, it also denotes the sun emitting multiple forces of gravity. One to attract bodies, hurling away from it. Another to push bodies away, hurling towards it. And then another to stabilize everything after all the forces have been applied. No, gravity always behaves the same, and there aren't variations of gravity. However, gravity isn't always the only force in play. If an object is affected by the sun's gravity, and no other forces are present, then the object will simply be pulled towards the sun. If, however, an object has a tangent velocity, then that along with gravity combined together will give an orbit around the sun. As for pushing bodies away from the sun, gravity doesn't do that. But rather, what you're probably referring to are objects that are moving away from the sun fast enough to escape its gravitational pull. See, this is why we don't have people like you, who don't even have the most basic understanding of physics work at NASA. God damn. Number four, Venus is spinning the wrong way. Yeah, let's just throw that out there without mentioning any of the proposed hypotheses on why that may be the case. Here's my favorite one, and I think it's quite relevant to what we're talking about. It's not that Venus is spinning in the wrong way, but rather it used to spin correctly but had its axis tilted 180 degrees. This was due to the sun's gravitational pull on its dense atmosphere. And like I mentioned earlier, any massive substance that isn't equally distributed can cause the planet to tilt. And this is basic physics. With such a dense atmosphere, Venus can very easily be flipped to wild angles, and that's that's what likely happened. That and perhaps a combination of factors that exists on Venus's surface. Oh, and by the way, if you wanted to bring up the abnormality of Venus's spin direction, don't say that it disproves the Big Bang, because the expansion of space isn't what causes planets to spin in the same direction. That, my friend, is the conservation of momentum. So bringing up Venus's spin would only apply to that, not to the Big Bang. You can't even match the criticism right with the concepts you're trying to disprove. Number five, there's no geologic evidence that the, another planet struck the Earth. That's just a hypothesis to explain the moon. Very plausible explanation, that is. I agree there isn't conclusive proof, but no matter what, we do know that the moon exists and orbits around the Earth. Just because we don't know for 100% certainty how the moon got there doesn't mean we can't know what the moon physically is. Number six, axial tilt contradicts Newton's theory of centripetal force. Remember, the stone in Newton's sling was neither rotating nor was it tilting. Newton's sling? What in the world are you talking about? You're not talking about Newton's cradle, are you? No, I don't think anyone's that stupid to call it a sling. Welp, no idea what you're on about here, buddy. Let me just ask my live audience of this premiere if they know what it is. Hmm. Yes, yes, very interesting. Oh, there, Farhago says it's made of bullshit. Okay, yeah, that confirms it. There's no such thing as Newton's sling, as far as I'm concerned. Unless you're talking about how Newton's forces apply to a sling, which would be even more stupid in the context of your argument. Oh, and breaking down the rest of that sentence, how in the actual heck are you linking centripetal force with rotation or axial tilts? I don't see it. Centripetal force is the force that keeps objects in orbit, aka the force that pulls the object towards the center. In the case of planets, that would be gravity, but gravity would only be considered centripetal if it's used in the context of an object's orbit. It doesn't have much to do with rotation or axial tilts, which are more so the results of conservation of motion. Momentum. Okay, and as for your last point, you don't read it out, but I'm just going to briefly mention that it's the same point as you mentioned earlier, so we're not going to give it too much attention for now. Wow, I didn't expect to spend so much time talking about this when we haven't even gotten to the main points of my original video yet.
This is what makes it summer for the southern hemisphere, but winter for the north. By the way, if I say summer or winter without specifying hemisphere, I am usually referring to the northern hemisphere. Anyway, around Christmas, Antarctica also experiences 24-hour sunlight days for a few weeks, much like how Greenland can have 24-hour sunlights during the summer. This, however, cannot be easily explained away by the Flat Earth model. While it's possible to draw a model that gives the North Pole 24 hours of sunlight during the summer, there's currently no good explanation for how Antarctica can experience the same amount of sunlight during Christmas. Until now, that is. This video is going to be focused on that. Let's take a look. It's not like we're pulling this model out of nowhere, or that we're making up our own model and strawmanning you. This is the model that you flat earthers have presented to us. Time and time again, you guys use this to show us how the sun moves over the surface of the earth. Don't pin this on us, please. Oh god, more of that fake posturing civility. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Yes, you are strawmanning us, as I have demonstrated many times. Number one, the Bible does not describe the sun as a moving body. It is an instrumental converter of the original primordial light of Genesis 1. <laughs> really? I can say for certain that that's just your own interpretation. I made this video in response to the Flat Earther that made that Gleason Glass Dome model video, not to you. And I'm pretty sure that most Flat Earthers don't interpret the sun that way. Their model involves the sun moving in a circle pattern in the sky, lighting up a local area. Plus, a lot of Flat Earthers are atheists as well, so they don't even take the Bible as truth. I don't know what model of the Earth you subscribe to, but I'm just going to skip over your own subjective interpretation on what the sun and stars are. Don't accuse me of strawmanning just because it's different than what you argue for because that video was never made for you. Well, let's talk about that glass object you are using. The first thing I noticed is that, well, it's solid all throughout. Not like your actual flat earth model where you would have a glass cap but within is air. Your argument assumes that you know the substance of the firmament, which you don't, it's total speculation. Uh, flat earthers have called it glass since the beginning. I'm not calling it glass myself, that's just from the flat earthers. Plus, it being glass is hardly relevant to what I said. My point was that the model was solid throughout, which can't be the case in reality since we are physically in air. That changes the refractive patterns, which I mentioned later on in the video. And the glass is designed to show the role the atmosphere plays in refraction, which for centuries you people have ignored. As I have shown, Euclidean geometry does not take into account atmospheric refraction. Skiba showed atmospheric lensing can explain the sunsets that you people said could not be explained before his demonstrations. And as Steve Torrance proved, it also distorts the way the stars appear to the observer on Earth. Nice. You know it's really fantastic when you talk as if I've seen all your videos and the videos you mentioned. Makes me really not want to respond because I have no substance to go off of unless I waste my time going over those videos. Put it in your own words next time and maybe we can have a discussion. Are you actually trying to deceive your audience by pulling the old switcheroo? <laughs> You're gonna lecture us about deception? That's precious. I have already shown your deceptive techniques just in the first couple minutes. You're kinda bad at this, aren't you? I repeat, the main point I was making was that the dome is supposed to be hollow underneath, not solid throughout like what the guy used in his model. I then explain later on in the video why that makes a difference, but I guess you lack the listening abilities to properly comprehend what I said. Now, for the rest of this video, he just keeps spinning his little flashlight around this Earth model. His little flashlight? All you did was show a cartoon of the tilting Earth. You didn't even give an inkling of evidence for it, so you can take your fake doughboy civility and shove it. Ooh, I'm sensing a little salt in your voice. Salty, salty, salty. All these flavors and you choose to be salty. I called it a little flashlight because guess what? It's literally a small flashlight. How does, how does anyone get so triggered over that? One issue here is how your model isn't consistent with any other models you have presented. Why is the sun here outside the glass dome? Read a basic Hebrew commentary on Genesis 1. The sun, moon, and stars are not bodies. 
they convert the primordial light on the other side of the firmament as has already been demonstrated. Yeah, you know, I don't really care about your own interpretations using the Bible, because guess what? The Bible is fallacious and just flat out wrong on so many levels. I'm just going to go off the common model that has been presented to me by the Flat Earth community. We can always have another separate discussion on your own personal beliefs, but that's not what this video is about, so I'm going to skip all that nonsense. I'm pretty sure you guys have already presented to us a model in which the sun would reside inside of the dome. This causes many problems. See, in the model in which the sun would be within the glass, the light distribution would be much different than in your presentation. We would again have the regular local spotlight sun that would illuminate only a circle around itself and not half of the earth. Just because we depict it inside the dome does not mean we believe it is the light emitting body. It is simply a converter. <laughs> We know this from the fact that the sun has black spots on it. That is impossible given your theory that it is a fusion bomb. For someone who presses a lot about showing evidence, you sure have none yourself. You jump from the sun having sunspots to, oh, therefore it's a converter of the light in Genesis. Ridiculous. Sunspots occur due to reduced temperatures resulting from alterations in the magnetic field. How exactly would that be impossible if the sun underwent fusion? Your jump in logic involves zero understanding of physics. I recommend picking up a textbook instead of burying your head in an ancient book written by people with no knowledge of science whatsoever. Every lunar eclipse we can see the moon giving off its own light. If the fact that the moon derives its light from the sun, then a lunar eclipse, if ipso facto and ao ipso, should show the moon completely dark. But that's not what we see. Oh yay, another claim made due to ignorance of physics. You could have just googled this and gotten an answer within 5 seconds. The moon is red during a lunar eclipse because it no longer derives light directly from the sun, but rather it receives refracted sunlight from the earth. This bends the light around the earth and hits the moon. It appears red because blue light is scattered more heavily than red light due to Rayleigh scattering upon the light hitting the molecules within the atmosphere. There are even equations and laws out there that can help you calculate exact values if you wanted to. Please, at least google this information before you make silly claims about them. Alright, let's talk about this model lighting up Antarctica. I can see what you're doing here. The light coming out of your flashlight is being refracted by the glass and thus produces the shape of light we see, but only at the specific angle and distance you are holding it at, which is why when you lift the flashlight the entire earth is lit up. Now I've mentioned this earlier, but the dome can't just be solid all throughout its interior. We are in air, so if anything the dome should be hollow inside. You are in a medium that is not accounted for by geometry. I already documented this in detail in my documentaries on astronomy and geometry. You don't like the fact that we are living in a continuum. It completely contradicts your entire view of reality. And so you're trying everything you can to dismiss it, because that would mean your life has been based on a lie. All the years in college, all the money you've invested in these lies, would loom over you like an ominous typhoon. You're too much of a scared little girl to face the truth. Yes, we are in a medium. But guess what this medium is? Yes, it's air! Wow, surprise, surprise. Again, I'm not going to address your points if you keep saying, well, I've already talked about this previously. Because frankly, there's no way for me to go through your entire channel and your live streams to find where you described it in more detail. Also, throwing insults isn't going to get you anywhere. My skin is pretty thick, you can't really offend me that easily. Let's just ignore the fact that your model should place the sun within the dome for the sake of argument. The angle of light is altered when it enters from one media to the next, given that they have different indexes of refraction. The greater the difference, the greater the angle change. That is why the light seems to be distorted when you are staring into objects inside a swimming pool. The water has a higher index of refraction, about 1.33 at room temperature, compared to air, which is just slightly over 1. We can calculate the angle change using Snell's law, where n1 and n2 are the indexes of refraction of the two media, and theta1 and 2 are the angles relative to the normal. Punch in any number and you will see that light will bend towards the normal if it is entering from a lower index of refraction to a higher one. On the other hand, the light will bend away from the normal if it is the other way around. Again, you run from experimental facts to your cartoons and your baseless theories. Yep, classic. You clearly just didn't understand what I said about Snell's Law, so you just dismissed it calling it a silly cartoon. Newsflash, Snell's Law is very well demonstrated and you can even calculate it yourself. Just fill up a glass bowl with water and shine a laser into it, then measure the angles and crunch it into Snell's Law. You can do the same with glass or anything else as long as it has a different index of refraction. But I'm not going to ask you to actually do it since apparently your grasp of science is so pitiful you probably wouldn't even be able to hold a protractor. Ooh, how's that for an insult? <laughs> 1. You have no theory of light. The corpuscular theory was refuted by Leon Falkjot, and the wave theory was refuted by Philip Lennard. Okay, aside from the lack of validity of the bullshit claims you just made, what does that have to do with refraction in Snell's Law? 2. 
there are no units in geometry to account for the medium of the atmosphere or for the lines to represent rays of light. Uh, do you know what units are? It's a standard used to measure quantity of a certain phenomenon. In the case of Snell's law, the mediums have a property which I mentioned called index of refraction. Light has multiple units depending on what aspect you are looking at. Like speed would be measured in meters per second, or its luminous intensity is measured in lux. The lines itself is simply a display of direction, which doesn't exactly have a unit, but the angles of entry or exit of medium are in radians or degrees. I don't know what kind of unit you're expecting, but at this point you're just spouting random nonsense. You cannot use those lines to represent rays of light. A. Eh? You are assuming light rays move in straight lines. <laughs> okay. Light is straight unless something causes it not to be, such as the influence of gravity or refraction, which could bend it. I think for the sake of my sanity, the response is going to end here. There's no way I'm going to argue more against someone who can't even meet the basic fact that light travels in straight lines. I didn't get through too much of his video, but if you guys want to check out the rest of it, there will be a link in the description. He does go on more to explain his light not traveling in straight lines idea, but I don't think it's really worth watching. I kind of came into this expecting him to provide better arguments that directly pertained to the points I made in my original video, but I guess you can't expect too much from flat earthers. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you were here for the premiere, I hope you enjoyed watching it live with me. And thank you to Fireshard and Daniel Seibel for being the top tier patrons this month. I'll see you guys next week.